And then uh, tonight is our uh, Urban Design Forum on Tiny Homes. And we're very thrilled to have four presenters here tonight to, uh, to discuss the work that they're doing uh, in uh, Nashville and uh, Tennessee region. And I'm not going to, their full bios are on our website for the program. Uh, and I'll, let, uh, I'll introduce uh, the group and then they'll each get presentations. We'll have time for a few short questions after each presentation and then a group uh, question session when they're all completed. So uh, joining us tonight, we have uh, David Latimer, who's with Nashville Tiny Homes. We have Ben Scoop, who's here with us from LP Building Products. We have Sarah Murphy, who's here from Music City Tiny House. And Jeremy Weaver, who actually drove in from Chattanooga to present the work he's doing with the Wind River Tiny Homes. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to David to get started. Presenting up there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm David. I like tiny homes. <laughs> uh, my name is David Vladimir. I'm actually born and raised in Nashville. Um, I'm currently building two tiny homes, and uh, I'm going to give you a little background about myself and how I got into tiny homes. So I graduated from university uh, with a degree in literature and philosophy. After college, I was interested in pursuing uh, experience over any one career path. So for about 10 years, I traveled all over and lived in a bunch of different places, working in a bunch of different industries. Uh, that whole time, I was making more than enough money, um, collecting cool art and furniture and clothing, and had plenty of stuff to make me happy. Uh, but it didn't. And I couldn't help this nagging, incessant anxiety that continued to swell in me over the years, comparing myself to this person and that person, to this standard, that standard. Uh, and I moved back to Nashville about two and a half years ago. Uh, crushing professional uh, disappointment led me to a year and a half of serious introspection. During that time, I came across the Tiny Home House Movement. And uh, the philosophy drew me in, and uh, it inspired me to dedicate my working life and my working hours to furthering its cause. So why tiny homes? It's a great question, and tiny homes are all about the why. So the philosophy is, is simple. It's this. Life is short. Who amongst us, sitting on our deathbeds, would rather be surrounded by our stuff rather than our people, recalling shared experiences? Tiny homes are about economic responsibility. They're about eliminating debt. They're about finding a work-life balance, about environmental sustainability, about individual autonomy. Um, they're about a lot of things that are very positive, that are both, so, they're both deeply conservative and deeply progressive. Um, the, the thing downsizing for me has been, uh, well, I thought it was impossible, I thought it was going to be impossible, it's been one of the most liberating things I've ever experienced. So, what is a tiny house? You all know, everybody in here probably, but this is kind of the trend. Uh, tiny house is a tiny house on wheels. The foundation is a trailer, uh, 75 to 240 square feet. Uh, they're built the same as a foundation home, the same materials, the same skill, craftsmanship, and by and large, the same codes if it's a quality builder. Uh, you have a full kitchen, a full bath, full appliances. It's just smaller. They're amazing in an urban setting. They're raising a rural say, and they are amazing to take with you wherever you want to go. <laughs> uh, tiny house on foundation is, is generally called a micro home or cottage, and it's generally anything under a thousand square feet. Uh, they're beautiful, again, built the same way that a larger home is. Uh, they're just built with more attention to detail, to functionality, to utility. So, again, why tiny homes? There's a number of big problems that are national issues and local issues. Starting with the national issues, and tiny homes are an amazing solution for each of these. So environmental, this is a hot topic, a, a, a lot of debate depending on the generation. I'm not going to get into climate change and that hot button, but uh, it's undeniable that evidence is indisputable that there is a serious depletion of resources. Um, the deficiency of it, almost anything you look at that is naturally grown and born of the earth. So, tiny homes are one, one of the most sustainable ways that us as individuals, as consumers, can live, can choose to live in a tiny space. Not just a tiny home on wheels, but a tiny space. The amount of fossil fuels required to power a house uh, is quite a bit, a traditional 2,500 square feet or more. Uh, and then as far as building goes, 
uh, disrupting a, an industry like building is decades, decades in the making. So we're not trying to do that. We're still using the same, a lot of the same techniques, but we're just using a lot less materials, a lot less resources, and a lot less waste to accomplish our end goal. Economics. So we live in a time where income is changing. It's going from labor to capital, right? And the wealth disparity, the income disparity, is worse than it's been since 1928. And I've read a bunch of metrics and studies that says that it's the worst it's been in history, in recorded history. Uh, that's alarming. For anybody who's a student of history, a student of revolution, um, that should, wherever you fall on that spectrum, red flags should be going on. Tiny homes provide a very rich life, right? Tiny living provides a very rich life with very little expense. Um, you can still have this full, adventurous, uh, exciting, enriching life, even on a very low income. And uh, in 2014, I spent $16,000. It was one of the most rewarding, challenging, fulfilling years I've ever had. So to Nashville, we are in an affordable housing crisis. I don't care who you are or what you say. Uh, it's not just affordable <laughs> housing. That, that, that has a negative stigma. It's attainable housing, right? It's, it's median to young professionals, to young people moving to town, to college graduates. It's hard to find housing. Uh, so from February 2013 to, Jan to uh, September 2014, the median rental price for a house went from $890 to $1,300. It's a 46% increase, and that number is steadily on the rise. Um, in, sorry, back. 76% I mean, of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. If you look at a younger generation, it's almost 100%. So a traditional mortgage versus a tiny house. The average 30-year mortgage, uh, the average mortgage is $250,000 right now, right? Roughly. Um, $50,000 to $60,000 for the down payment. Over that 30-year term, you're looking at paying $750 to $1,000 to $1 million uh, in taxes, interest, uh, repairs. That's a lot of money. The average price of a tiny house costs as, the, as much or less than the down payment. Um, can you imagine what you could do with $750,000 over 30 years? It's a, it's a lot of living, a lot of life. Uh, urban density and community. So uh, people are wanting to move into cities, especially younger people. More and more people, it's the first time in history that more people live in an urban setting than in rural settings. Um, so that takes creative solutions, and that takes a lot of uh, new thinking in order to accommodate that. The thing about tiny houses is they're a solution right now. It's not a hypothetical, it's not a product in development. It's not a what if we do this and this and this. It's like, no, we build one, it works right now. You can put it in undevelopable land. You can put it, it requires very little infrastructure and you can get a lot of these things and still have a lot of green space and open space on a plot of land. Uh, there's Bonard Studios, that plot of land was considered undevelopable and it became a place for four people to live comfortably. Uh, there was an urban garden, community garden, uh, where everybody in the neighborhood was able to participate in. Uh, here's a concept out in Oregon. You see the, the big common space, right? Well, you can still have a huge dinner party. You can still have a huge party. You can have a soiree. You can do the things you want to do in a bigger home. Um, you just got to look at a little bit in the past. Uh, agriculture is another industry that's changing rapidly. Um, so tiny house communities and urban farms are a, a cool thing that, are, that I see a lot of people working with and developing. Uh, this is Caravan Tiny House Hotel in Portland, another concept in California, and then another little tiny house thing in Oregon. So what are the challenges? The challenges, why aren't tiny homes everywhere? Um, it's, it's a product, a proven product. People are want to, use it, want to live in it right now. Um, but it's, it's something new, and it's zoning and codes are not uh, privy, you're not sure what to do with it, right? And I can understand the reluctance, I can understand you know, the uncertainty. Um, the, the issue is it just makes so much sense, right? And there's got to be a way that we can creatively, we're trying to creatively work uh, in, in a way that makes sense for the city, a way that makes sense for the community, a way that makes sense for individual citizens. Nashville, um, I'm sure y'all have seen a couple of these things around town. Uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with them. They do fulfill urban density. Um, and it's a free market society. You should be able to leverage and 
you know, extract as much value from your goods and services as you legally can. Uh, this is fine, but if you're really after urban density, you could put four to eight micro homes on the same single family plot of land, and you actually have green space. You actually can see the trees on the area and the land around. Um, so the, the issue is, is, is we want to, we're trying to engage in a, a good conversation, respectful conversation. We'll get creative. If we have to pay a much higher tax rate to allow these things to be legal, to, to be the equivalent of a 2,500 square foot house, great. Um, so here's uh, my first county house that I'm building. I'm building in Riverside Village. Some of you may have seen it. Um, one of the things I can't stress enough is quality. I would put the quality of, of my homes and Wind River homes against any builder in the state of Tennessee. Um, because they are in a trailer, and that trailer is going to outlast me uh, without any repair, need for repair. Um, because they're building on a trailer, we over engineer them. So they're rated for a hurricane, they're rated for an earthquake. Um, they've got all these little details in them that are going to make them last and withstand almost anything. Uh, again, because you're building in a small area, you can afford closed cell, spray foam insulation, hardwood floor, hardwood walnut floor. You can afford to go a little bit all out on the details, the, the, you know, the appliances, the finishes. Uh, and it really is a form of luxury that everyone can afford. You want a Viking range? Cool. You want a gold plated toilet seat? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, So there's me happy that I'm almost done with this deck thing. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a wonderful opportunity here, right? And, and I'm excited about it. The future of housing uh, is no doubt tiny. It's going to be a big percentage of housing in the future. No doubt about it. I bet my life on it. Um, we have an opportunity in Nashville to be a leader in that, right? To, to show other people a model of how this can work. And it's exciting, and it's fun, uh, and it's, it makes sense economically, it makes sense ethically, it makes sense for the community, it makes sense for the city, and it makes sense for the nation. So again, I'm David, and thank you for your time. Uh, yeah, so the question is, how does the plumbing work? It works just the same as it does in a normal house, right? Uh, it can. What's that? Where does it go? Where does your plumbing go? It goes out to the street. Right, it goes to the city, the city system. So you can hook it up to the city system. Um, this is a conversation that everybody's asked in Tiny Home World. Uh, you will be amazed. First of all, let me just say this. this is, since we're on the gross topic, it is unbelievable how many resources it requires to turn our black water into potable, usable water. It's unbelievable. Just please do a little bit of digging and research. Uh, composting toilets have come a very long way, and that's, that's my, my jam. I'm, uh, I'm encouraging people to use composting toilets. It solves a whole lot of problems, and it's not gross. And, you know, it's, it's nice to be responsible for your own shit, literally. <laughs> Do you plan on building micro homes as well and not just tiny homes? Yes, I do eventually, uh, right now, you know, one step at a time. But there's, you know, there's, it's a little bit of a lower hanging fruit because there's not as many codes or not as many zoning regulations. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, is there an opportunity to be able to like test out a tiny home if you're considering one? Is it something that where you can live in it for a month and try and see if it's for you? Yeah, great question. So I'm actually talking to several different people uh, about setting up like an urban echo village, um, one of which we might have on Airbnb or have as like a, a exactly that a test ground because it is. There, I mean, make no mistake, it's a huge, huge sea change to go from normal house size or apartment size to a tiny house, and it requires a lot of work, a lot of preparation, and a lot more attention than you thought you'd ever have to give to something. Um, but it is a very deeply, richly rewarding experience. So, and that's that's a, a very important thing to allow people to test it out because it's not for everybody. Absolutely not for everybody. And I'm certainly not trying to force it on everyone. So, let's um, yeah, move on to Ben and uh, just housekeeping because we're a full crowd. If you have a seat next to you, <coughs> raise your hand. There's one right here. And if uh, this one, okay, so this one's taken. <laughs> and if you want to come up and take those seats. If you're uh, standing in the back to let room for other people.
one is from Blue Zam and Smith. Okay, so, uh, yeah. okay building products. We're actually headquartered right up the street on 4th and Union. So, <coughs> you guys walk down here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for giving us the opportunity to speak to you. I'm probably going to speak to a little bit smaller part of the tiny home movement. Uh, I'm going to dwell in particularly on materials. Uh, and, uh, the reason for that is as a building materials manufacturer, we simply make parts that enable people to build beautiful things. So we, we try to remind ourselves what our role is. And the part I want to talk to you about is some innovations in materials. Uh, but again, these are just things we provide to the market. It's the builders that take them and make something wonderful out of them. So this will probably be a little bit more uh, nuts and bolty, if you will, as we go through it. But I do have some cool pictures. <laughs> so uh, obligatory propaganda up front. Uh, we're a company. And uh, we have employees in mills around the world. But, uh, just sometimes we explain that a lot of people have thought we owned the Titans for a while. <laughs> it was a great 10 years to sponsor it. So. <laughs> Maybe for Nissan, they'll get to the bowl games. Uh, but we're headquartered here in, in Nashville. Our, our factories are spread throughout North and South America. Um, we make things primarily uh, for single family new construction. This is just a little bit of the offering. And if you think about the parts that we make, we make the bones and the skins of the house. So structural members, uh, sheathing, and exterior cladding. Um, actually, Jeremy is uh, one of our customers, and I'm using some of our exterior cladding called Smart Side. But those are core products. I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the innovations we brought to the market and some of the history uh, between LP and the tiny homes. Uh, we do a lot of work with shelter. This is one of our main efforts. It's obviously our bloodline in terms of business. In terms of the uh, types of organizations we want to involve ourselves with, we tend to be involved around shelter types of things. We have a few others, like pencil box, but these are the types of things we want to be involved with, building them out of shelters. And it's really good to see uh, an organization such as this uh, addressing the other end. I've, I've been here since 2004, um, and I've seen the boom in the economic, and it's really good to see people taking a, a second look and talking about the folks that are a little less advantaged and how we do something. So that kind of fits in their wheelhouse too. Um, that's my friend Andrew Oden. Um, that is a tiny home that he built in northern Georgia. Uh, some of you may know him as the Tiny Revolution blogger. Uh, got together with Andrew about four years ago, uh, sent him some of our products, and uh, asked him to try them out and see what he thought about them. And to be uh, correct, uh, he said on his blog, I hope he gave me this stuff and asked me to talk about it. Um, so you get the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, that's Andrew. Um, he was also a featured speaker at the Tiny Home Jamboree. Some of you may have heard of or read about. That was in August last year up in Colorado Springs. Uh, myself and a couple of co-workers went out there to sponsor it. To be honest, kind of check it out, see what it was all about. Um, we think maybe 12, 1,500 people would show up. There's like over 40,000 people come. <laughs> food trucks ran out of food at 11. We ran out of every sample we had by you know, the second day. Um, that just kind of gives you a flavor for uh, a little bit of what the movement is and how much interest there is. And I was surprised um, there was more like demographic types than I thought seeking tiny homes. You had a little bit of stereotype in your head, and then you've got families, you've got professionals, you've got retirees, you've got young people, just all cuts of society coming out very interested on these tiny homes. But to give you an idea of some of the materials I'm talking about, the yellow uh, panel siding is a product called LP Smart Side. Uh, you find that panel at Home Depot, Lowe's, and Lumber Yards. And then there's pieces in there you can't see in this picture, but we'll talk a little bit about those too. Um, also, I uh, can't go a moment without taking the opportunity to talk about a different type of tiny home. Uh, that's one of 250 uh, 80 cabins. Uh, now that's in a couple of our customers, uh, primarily our customers put together fabricated brought down to Haiti, uh, part of an outfit called Haiti Relief Missions that's been focused on housing in Haiti. But if you think about the similarity between uh, housing in, in a third world like Haiti versus what we're trying to do for uh, lower income or homeless folks in Nashville, there's a lot of similarities. So that's just one folks, uh, one set of folks inside of what they would call their tiny home. You and I might call it a big shed. Uh, but if you're Think about a disaffected family living in a field uh, under a blue tarp for weeks and months. It just basically turns to mud, right? So you're sleeping in mud, that tarp rips. Uh, so to get into what you and I might call shed or shell uh, is a castle for them. So that sparked a little bit of a, uh, some of our interest and our effort. And uh, some of there you can see some of the 
uh, innovations we brought. You can see how the inside of the panels are brown. Um, that's a, uh, basically a finished material wall. That's also the same thing that's the panel on the outside. So what you have there in one panel is an exterior siding, a structural wall sheeting, and a semi-finished interior panel. I'll talk about the importance of combining things when you look at tiny home design here in a second. Um, but the part of a home that, that I'm in is often in the parts that are kind of covered up. I provide shelves. Uh, for you. The homeless guy entertaining his home. Maybe he'll play a song for us. Huh? Uh, um, but a lot of times when you're trying to put together a home, um, especially depending on which environment you're in, speed's important. You got to protect yourself from the weather. You got to have material to protect against rot and bugs and termites, especially in the southeast. Um, and a lot of times with tiny homes, given that they're on wheels um, and you do have to move them around, weight's a big factor. I'll show you again some of the weight considerations. You also got to realize when you're bouncing that thing down the highway behind your F-150, you got to have something that's durable and can put up. I'm sure if you guys have moved a couple of years, you got to go back in and maybe fix a few things, right? So you got lightweight, flexible, durable, and strong. Um, so this little video that I'm going to show you is basically addresses those issues. Um, it's primarily built around uh, how, how would you build a quick home in an area that normally wouldn't be built. Um, so put that together. So what was that that we just saw? building. <laughs> the point that you should notice there is that it's just, it was daylight the whole thing. That was about a four hour build, two guys. There was no power cords. All they were using was a hammer. And we saw that it came in pieces and parts. Um, so again, this is just conceptual in terms of materials. What they basically did for about 4,000 bucks is gave you the shell of a home. Now you're gonna come in and do finishing on the interior, the whole nine yards, put electrical in there, whatever you want. But in terms of what a material uh, manufacturer like ourselves can do is we're given options. And this is just kind of a case study of, hey, if you're trying to put together you know, something that's about 150, 180 feet, and you want to get that shell together real quick, and it's lightweight, flexible, and all that, that's just an example of how you use it. So it's a little different when you're in actual tiny home production. But again, a lot of these are just meant to kind of spark the ideas. And make you aware that there are innovations in building materials, um, there are new things since plywood. That's about a hundred year old technology. Um, but there are there are materials to be looking for because when you're building a tiny home, it's not like building a two thousand square foot site built house. Um, you got a lot of different factors, so you got to get creative. Um, a lot of it is uh, taking things that you had three or four layers doing it. And you don't need one. So that uh, I thought I'd bring you some pictures. These will probably look familiar to a lot of you. Uh, these are the tiny home jamboree. Um, those are all on wheels. Um, very, very typical tiny home there. Um, that's more of your type of cabin, if you will. I call that one a cottage because I didn't quite know what to call it. Um, and a chalet. Um, actually, you showed a picture of some of that too. Out in Colorado, there's a lot of those. No weekend skiers want to. So, again, uh, just the, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with here trying to find my time is uh, the mobility challenges. And uh, we work with a lot of different industries, whether it's folks that uh, manufacture RVs, manufacture prefabricated sheds, or manufacture uh, <coughs> homes. They face a lot of these same mobility challenges, and they're very similar for the tiny homes. A different market, per se, but the challenges are, are similar. Um, I imagine nothing's tougher than when you build one and you try to get your truck to pull it, and it doesn't work. Or you go down the hill, and the house is pushing the truck, um, and it goes off on the bitch. 
So uh, one of the things I just want to talk about here was kind of taking a look at some of the different ways that people build the floor and wall, uh, floor and wall systems, and if you have weight as a consideration. Um, typical floor, 1932 subfloor, you put some nice three quarter oak on that. If you're doing about 600 square feet, that's uh, almost 2,900 pounds. So when you're doing any calculation on your home, think about that. We have a product that is a subfloor and pre finished or semi finished as well that a lot of people use as a finished floor. That's about 1,200 pounds. Different sidewall systems, everybody loves the look of cedar. Um, but you got a sheet and put cedar lap up and it does look beautiful, but it weighs a bunch. Uh, versus, uh, you remember the yellow house from the beginning, where the panel was the sheathing and the siding in one piece, well, that saves about a thousand pounds. Um, you can see the other comparisons against more uh, common uh, exteriors, if you will. Um, I think I saw you had probably T111 plywood in one of the houses. Or is that, maybe it was one of the pictures I showed that back over. But it's typical materials. And the only point I'm trying to make here is when you're looking to source materials, uh, look beyond maybe some of your traditional. There's some, some new products out there uh, that can help tiny help. That's it. I just want to be short and sweet. And again, thank you all, uh, both for the, the, the thought behind this and for letting us on some of you guys as well. Sir? Your LP smart side panel, mm -hmm. you said it takes the place of the siding and the OSB both? Yep, it's structurally rated, so on the back of it there's an uh, APA stamp, just like a plywood or your OSB sheeting. Um, and it has a fused in overlay, and it's treated uh, with zinc boarding that's right in the case. So uh, it is a sheathing product and an exterior and one piece. Four by eight sheet, four by eight. Uh, uh, ship lap edge, if you will. So it's got eight inch OC grooves, which means every eight inches there's a vertical groove. And the way the, the edges come together, it looks like another groove. Uh, think of the shed that you might see out on the field, or out on the lots, or at Home Depot and Lowe's, similar fashion. But it's structural and sheet in one piece. Is that a wood product and not cementious? It's a wood product and what? Or it's not cementious? No, sir. It's uh, made out of aspen. Uh, poplar is what some people might call it out there. Uh, we treat it again with uh, zinc bore, which is like the same stuff you find in the tie and makeup. And that's what protects it against uh, Mother Nature. But yeah, as uh, cementitious products, I used to promote them as well. Um, but they're made out of cement. Heavy and a little broke. So, especially if you're on a mobile structure, that can pose some challenges. Do you remember what it costs? Do you remember what it retails for? Uh, right now, a three, uh, thinner sheet, four by eight, will go for about 20, 30 bucks, Home Depot or those. Depends on which store you're shopping at. Would you ever insulate it with a bad insulation? Uh, and that, uh, I would, if you want the tightest, the poly uh, spray is probably the best. You can also do loose fill insulation or a regular bat behind it. But yeah, it works just like sheathing. So anything that you do in a normal sheath house, you do the same thing. There's one in the back. Or if not, more of an answer. I guess I probably have some drywall in the room. If you have problems with drywall, you can as far as cracking or anything like that. Um, that I would ask uh, Jeremy and David to answer that one. Uh, that's probably a bigger problem. With the <coughs> shells that we do, um, they would drywall it on site. Again, because the transportation in our experience has been that they typically the drywall is one of the first things to crack up. I don't know if that's the same. With we, we, we've never used drywall in the house. It's fairly rare. There's only one house I know of that has a tiny house I know of that has drywall in it. Uh, what do you guys use? Uh, tongue and groove or beadboard are, are the ones we use the most. Sir? So if all your homes are on wheels and mobile homes, why not just buy a trailer? That's how it's built. You all will know better, but in my impression, there is a lot of <laughs> two different things. Consumers have a preference for customizing it, let's say. They want it to be their own. Uh, versus a uh, kind of off the lot. Um, I would say that, that that particular industry that we've been involved with for a while has gone more after the, the price point rather than the amenities and some of the things that typically go in most of those units, um, people are going to want to upgrade. 
So I don't I'm trying to answer that politically correct. Those are not questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, some of the guys who build uh, build nice cabin uh, boats and you know, ships, mm -hmm. small 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 sailing vessels and stuff like that. Yeah. Had already had that technology mm -hmm. and are doing that for yeah. trailers. There's a lot of transferability if you think about houseboats or have you looked at the comparison of cost on having something that's already bought that's a high quality high end let's say uh, a craftsman boat builder who's built at home and what, what we think we can do starting out as an analysis? Um, if I started the answer to that, I'd start off not knowing and end up lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, can, I can speak to that a little bit during my question. Yeah. Okay. So should we transition? Sure, sure. that'd be great. Okay. Why are we working so hard to spend all of our money on these things 
and we're still struggling to keep up. Um, and so we had a little bit of an existential crisis as to like what that meant for us. Um, so we decided to build and buy a tiny house. We didn't build it. Uh, we, I can barely hang photos straight, so uh, <laughs> we had someone else do it. Um, but then it was, how do we pay for it? Where do we park it? How do we power it? What do you do with the fresh water and dispose of the gray water? Uh, what about the sanitation of tiny houses? Where is it legal? Um, and ultimately, the main question was, who was out there that could help us navigate these questions? The answer was really nobody. Um, and that's when my husband and I decided, screw it, we're doing it anyways, and we're going to use it as an advocacy tool. Um, because we saw so much potential in the tiny house movement. Uh, potential there to help with chronic homelessness benefits to urban infill, which in Nashville, the urban infill is how we're going to solve our affordable housing crisis. It doesn't have to mean building up. We don't have to lose our skyline. Uh, it's a vital option for singles, young people, just starting out, retirees, looking for mobility, etc. There isn't a single demographic that you can point at and say, these are tiny house people. Uh, housing security, uh, after the recession, and all of the financial things that my husband and I went through, we know we still have our tiny house. So you know, no matter what happens, we still own a place to live. Uh, and that, that feels pretty good. And it's paid off. Um, and then the environmental factors, which we, uh, David actually talked a little bit about. So that's why we became advocates. But let's talk a little bit more about who, who, who's in this room, who's out in other countries interested in the tiny house movement. Um, as you can see, it's kind of all over the board, but we get a lot of people thinking it's just the hipsters that are interested in tiny homes. Um, and you see that's not true. Um, you know, we get a lot of people who are saying, well, you know, if, you, if you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s and you have, you know, a family, these people that invented the American dream, right? The ones that took our crash, they're interested too. Debt versus income. We hear about a lot, people want financial freedom. They don't want to have to live paycheck to paycheck. Um, and when you spend less on your living, you have more to do those other things. Especially within the millennials, uh, experiences are worth way more than, than stuff. Doesn't mean we don't also collect stuff. People who are not currently in tiny houses, but really would like to be. These are the reasons why. The big old red one is zoning. Gosh, that's such an easy one that we can fix. Uh, but there it is. Uh, the not enough money for a tiny house. That one's an easy one to fix too. Uh, and that's not just handing out a bunch of money. Uh, maybe it is, but lending is a real problem. Lending is a problem because banks aren't gonna touch tiny houses because they're not able to put anywhere. Uh, so we have to start, you know, somewhere and then we can work on all these other things. But for the most part, more than half of the, the reasons why people aren't tiny houses yet would be really, really easy to solve if we all just came together and started talking about what it looks like if this if we had it and what little changes we have to make to make it happen instead of saying, well it's just not legal and there's just so many things to, that we have to work out. Talk a little bit uh, about this I think David did, but um, when it comes to ownership, 78% uh, of people in tiny houses actually own their own homes compared to 64% of the people who own their own homes. But that even 64% own their own homes, but they ain't really their own. Um, but they, uh, they live in it, which is nice that they still can do that. 78% uh, uh, have, or 68% have no mortgage on tiny houses. 35% uh, have no mortgage on their big house. And then uh, the great, uh, environmental factor of CO2, 2,000 uh, pounds per year for a tiny house compared to 28,000. Um, so if environment is one of your drivers, that's, I think, what's really important about tiny houses is that I can't blanket say as to why everyone's in this room because everyone has their own reasons. It's not only, really, uh, it's not just a ton of reasons, but they're super personal reasons as to why one person decides to go tiny versus saying, Just real quick, who's already doing it well? In regards to the homeless, I invite you to go uh, check out Square One Villages in Oregon. 
Um, they're actually opening up their second village because it's worked so well for them. You'll see a lot of uh, media coverage behind the homelessness aspect. One, because people are willing to get behind it, even if it's not really legal. We have one here in Nashville, actually, at the Infinity Church, I believe. Nobody's shutting down. Uh, and the reason is because it's for a good cause, right? So uh, tiny houses can get more and more traction, possibly through this out of this avenue. But one of the reasons it's so great is because you can put so many in one place, but you can couple it with supportive services, which if you follow the housing first model of solving chronic homelessness, the first thing to, uh, is to house them, obviously, but you can't just house them. You have to also supply, supply them with supportive services. So, you know, medical care, so they're not in the ER every night. They have some place that they can go, job training. Um, you know, there's a number of things that they can, you know, art therapy. Those things really help any chronic homelessness. Um, and Square One Villages is doing a great job with that. Communities, we get this question all the time. Uh, why don't we just start a community? Like, has anyone started a community? Like, I'm sure you guys get that stuff all the time, right? There's like, it was so easy to be doing it, right? Um, and it's super expensive, and uh, people don't want to, uh, to pay that kind of money. So why, want to go in, why they want to go tiny is to save a bunch of money, and they find out they have to like, rent a lot. Lemon Cove is doing a really great job here in California. It's still like five or six hundred dollars a month to get uh, a slot. Um, but then you have the shared community uh, resources like laundry and um, maybe like a garden plot and all those things. Um, but uh, they're doing it well. There's a bunch of them that are popping up, but that was a good model to look at. How are they doing it? They bought an RV park. Uh, and Urban Infill, Fresno, California, recently was the first place to legalize tiny houses on wheels um, as accessory dwelling units. And so this was a big win for tiny houses, but it was also only a partial win because it's great that you can put tiny houses in Fresno, but you have to own a piece of land that has a primary resident on it. So that's kind of a partial win, right? Because uh, ideally you just want to be able to buy a plot of land and stick a tiny house on it. You wouldn't have to want to, you don't want to have to buy a big house. And, uh, to stick a tiny box on, or make a friend who's willing to let you stick it in the backyard. But it's a big step. This is my favorite influencer I've ever. Uh, and it's just a little comedy here. You can't read it, um, but it's it's uh, my favorite part. It's like uh, 30% of the, I can't even see it. But, um, it looks much better on the camera than I prefer I got the big screen. Um, but I put this up here mainly because I saw something on TV the other day. It was talking about Nashville. And they're like, yeah, lots of people with skinny jeans and big wallets. Um, there's no time. There's no just here. I can I can tell you. Um, but that's all that I have, and so I'd love to open it up um, to you guys to ask me questions about tiny houses. Yeah. Can you tell us about Nashville's the, the Nashville zoning <coughs> policy with regard to wheel you know wheel tiny houses or non wheel or just. <coughs> Sure, and that would be a three-hour seminar, but I can give you the short term. Yeah, uh, short term. It's not legal um, to litter, but um, there are some uh, some zones, and literally my house is zoned differently than the house next to mine. So it's important that you look at your individual zoning that allow for accessory dwelling units. And accessory dwelling units, do you need a primary residence on the property? You do need to go through permitting. Every house can be on foundation, can be on wheels, but that is an avenue. For tiny house living in Nashville that is currently by the book in New York. But there are several that don't have that uh, accessory dwelling uh, option. Yeah. RS. And RS. RS. Yeah, and there's uh, there's there's also some like in East Nashville, I think that's part of East Nashville's passed so that they can have that big use and part of the house. So it really is independent to what tree with. Define an accessory dwelling. Sure, accessory dwelling unit uh, basically means that it's, a found, it's on a foundation, it is a smaller unit that is secondary to a primary unit that is on a plot of land. So, um, you know, my house, my property in uh, Window Vista, it's got in, in the big house, it's 1200 square feet, and uh, it's zoned for two residences. And so it, uh, I could build a secondary unit on that property. It has to be on foundation. It can be no larger than 700 square feet. Um, it can't be any taller than my one-story house. Um, it can be up to 950, I think, if you have it with a garage. Um, but, and then it's, everything else is, the permits and everything is, is just by the book. And it has to look like your main structure, too. 
Uh, what if you just disregard the county? <laughs> That's a great question. What can they? What consequences can they legally impose upon? Thank you for asking that. Because that's largely what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> so there's a, it's a zoning guy that we speak to regularly. Um, really good. Um, it's there are two ways to go about this. We're trying to do both. Um, we don't live in ours, by the way. But um, you can go about it and try and change the regulations, which we were really, really trying to do. Um, or you can ask for forgiveness instead of permission, um, which is kind of the route where we went. And we we're like, we're going to stick it on our land, and we're going to pray you come to our door during, or right before uh, the vote. So it's like, knock, 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 and like, come out. He's telling me all these things, and I was like, well, what's your uh, plan for affordable housing and the, the prices that we have here in Nashville? And he gave me his candy answer, and I was like, well, let, me, let me show you mine. And I'm like, come on around back. And you know, he looks at it, he's like, gosh, he's like, that's awesome. And he's like, um, well, I won't tell anybody that you have it. <laughs> Please tell everybody that we have it. We know that we can get shut down tomorrow, but that's not why we're doing it. Uh, we're what doing shut down mean? It shut down meaning that we would not be allowed to host um, people who are trying to test drive a tent. I probably should have mentioned that that's what we do, um, but someone had asked earlier. Um, the reason that we have ours on our property is we uh, invite tiny house enthusiasts to come and stay and try out the tiny space. Um, and so they could shut us down and zoning boards could not. I would I'd love to answer all your questions, but I was told I can't. So but don't worry, the, the, the last uh, presenter, Jeremy, is better than all of the, the us three. So. So I'm 6'6", I'm six, six, just to get that out of the way, <laughs> and I do live in a tiny house myself, so I'm, I feel like I'm a pretty good example for um, the fact that it could work for you know pretty much anyone. Um, my name is Jeremy Weaver, um, I own, I'm, I'm co-owner of a business called Wind River Tiny Homes, um, and I'll just give you a really quick brief what, you know, what our business is and what we do, um, and then I got a bunch of pictures of houses where we've built or that we're building and then I'll try to leave a good amount of time for questions. Um, so we started kind of as a sole proprietorship unincorporated business in the end of 2013. Um, we were we became an official LLC in 2014 and kind of what it grew out of is uh, a friend Travis Pike and I were building large McMansions together and, and I remember the specific conversation we were in the attic space, we were framing this house and we were in the attic space of the house and it was like 1,700 square feet of dead space in the attic, like obscene, like, and we were, we were just like, the whole day we were just laughing about like how many tiny houses you could fit in here, because we were both kind of in the throes of researching tiny houses as many of you might be, um, and it just kind of consumed your thoughts, you know, about the possibilities and living in what, it, what living in a tiny house would look like. And, this is kind of where we were, and we were just, you know, talking about how much dead space was in this attic. Um, and so that's, that, I guess, is the spirit um, that, that uh, Wind River was born out of. Um, Travis and I decided shortly after that to start building these tiny houses. Um, had a friend that wanted us to build one for her. And that's kind of how we got started. Um, and we've been doing it ever since. And kind of our focus is, uh, Sounds similar to David. Um, we, we, we build uh, really high um, quality houses. Um, essentially, our uh, our best guarantee, um, or I guess I guess you know, there's there's with a tiny house, it's sort of this nebulous. Um, we're not we're not inspected, you know. So it's essentially you got to go by the tiny house builder. So there's a lot of tiny house builders that are building really really quality structures. Um, and then there's other guys that are just trying to make a quick buck that are kind of getting in on it because um, they see a market opportunity. And essentially, you know, just our, our, our ethics, we try to build the highest quality structure possible. Um, and, you know, we, our, our goal is for the house to be around in 100 years, you know, similar to a permanent foundation structure. Um, this is Travis's tiny house that he built um, himself and he lives in. You may have seen it. It's been shared on Pinterest quite a bit and stuff like that. Um, and it's a uh, cedar rain screen, um, it's concrete, uh, custom poured concrete counters, open oak um, shelving. 
And this is, this is sort of the aesthetic that we go for. Um, we use a lot of uh, high quality traditional materials. Um, and right now, the big thing we're trying to do is, is figure out how to, um, how to lighten our houses. Because um, really, what tiny house, uh, a lot of people are drawn to tiny houses because it has the aesthetic of a really high end cottage. Um, and so, right, the, the game, or not the game, but the, where we're at right now is we're trying to figure out how to, how to do things um, that make sense to decrease weight um, while still being able to maintain the really high quality feel um, and the purpose of being a permanent dwelling. Um, this is more, more pictures of Travis's house. This is my house. Um, I live in this house currently with my wife. Uh, we've been in it for about a year now. Um, it's a 32 foot gooseneck, uh, standard eight, eight and a half width, um, completely road legal. Um, this is our kitchen. We also have a kind of a mixed uh, concrete and live edge cedar countertop. Um, three, most of our plants are about three quarter size. Um, and a uh, couch that, that has storage and also folds out into a bed. Um, small, you know, folding table, stuff like that. We, have, we had a wood burning fireplace. Um, but we actually uh, turned that into our office space where the wood got pretty <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's like, what, four square feet or five square feet, but like in a tiny house, that's like, I don't know, like 10% of your house or something like that. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a, the, so I like to take baths. Um, sorry if that's too personal. Um, and so we, we did a little uh, compromise where the, the top of the bathtub can fold down, and my wife can take a shower, you know, at her, her level, and then, you know, it opens up, and I can take one and then shower <laughs> and, and, you know, which, is, which never happens for me. Like, I've literally, have, before this shower, I've never had a shower head that was, like, you know, higher than my eye level, so it's really nice. <laughs> Bedroom, I can uh, stand, you know, I, it's a full seven foot on the high side of the shed roof in our bedroom. So I can, I can stand on, you know, in, in our bedroom, which is rare for a tiny house. It's sort of one of the, uh, the, the advantages of going with a gooseneck design tiny house. Uh, another gooseneck design house that we just uh, a couple months ago shipped out to California uh, for a couple that are living in it um, outside of San Francisco. Um, called the Phoenix. Um, the, the exterior is uh, shiplap, and it's uh, it's all burnt, and then we sealed it with a sealer. So it, that's all a natural burning. The coloration is all from natural burning, and then we seal that over to waterproof it. Um, this, the, in, the interior is sort of a uh, rustic modern. Um, it's a lot of metal and wood, uh, live edge cedar. Um, that's an indoor outdoor bar area, so that, that's a, a French uh, window there, so there's no there's no center divider, so that completely opens up. On the outside, there's a, there's a folding up a bar top. Um, pretty much everything in this house is custom. That pocket door is completely custom. It's probably 15 hours in that. Um, the butcher block is custom. Live edge is custom. C cabinets are custom. The shelving is custom. Pretty much everything in this house is custom. That's kind of what, what our focus is. Uh, we, we have a really cool group of friends in the Chattanooga area that are you know, all craftsmen. and. We're just really lucky to have some really cool guys that can build some cool things. So, um, it's uh, shiplap walls, tongue and groove ceiling, uh, painted white. That's uh, one of the owners built that um, that vanity light there. It's all our houses um, are LED lights throughout. Um, there's a custom uh, storage stairs going up into the gooseneck bedroom area. Um, accent wood wall on the front there. Uh, this is a shell we actually just, um, so up to this point we've been building essentially made to order houses for, you know, for customers that come to us and have an idea and want us to turn it into a house for them. And we're just starting to experiment with building shells that feel really high in the custom um, and then uh, building them to essentially most of the way finished and then selling them to people who want to finish it up themselves that maybe don't have the expertise to be able to, you know, build it to this point. Um, or, you know, coming on at that, at this point and saying, okay, I want to choose this and this and this about the finishes of my house, but they don't necessarily want to choose everything about their house. So it's kind of something where this is the show we actually have sitting at our shop right now, um, that this is, you see the interior finishes. And similar to him, we use, uh, we use spray foam insulation on all our houses. Um, and they're, my house, um, so it's, in Chattanooga, it got down like a few weeks ago or a month ago, it was like 12 degrees, 15 degrees for like several days in a row. 
and like I'm getting my our entire house with a space heater that's this tall and this big round, one of those column space heaters, like heats our whole house, and it's got it's a self-controlling thermostat on it, and it shuts itself off like every every like 20 minutes because it it's like it, the insulation is incredible um, in a well-built tiny house, and that's another huge difference between an RV and a tiny house. Um, <laughs> the RV walls are about an inch thick and, and to heat or cool one of those things is a nightmare. <clears throat> this is a one, one, one current project we're working on. Um, it's going to Illinois when it's done. Um, and this one is actually probably one of our favorite layouts of all the houses. It's, uh, no, it's not on here, that's our footprint. Uh, this is one of our favorite layouts of any house we've done. It's a, it's a bumper pole and it's 26 feet long. And we're finding that a lot of people that are thinking of doing permanent dwelling, uh, permanent townhouse dwelling, especially couples, there's a lot of couples that we've had customers, uh, for some reason, a lot of couples, um, go you know, 24 to 30 foot in the 24 to 30 foot range. This is a 26 footer. It's got a separate office space because the guy works from home. Um, it's got a huge 10 foot loft. It's the biggest loft we've ever built and one of the bigger ones I've seen. Um, and storage stairs and you know, the layout's really cool. I wish I had a better picture of the layout. Um, and then we're about to start another one Friday that's going to Austin. Um, this is again kind of part of our endeavor to make it more, to make the kind of tiny house buying experience more accessible for people that want to get a house from us. So we came up with you know four kind of more standard floor plans that people can modify if they want. Um, so you know just just different options. Uh, we heard a lot of people reaching out to us that maybe didn't want to make all the decisions they needed a starting point. So we developed some of these floor plan options for people. Um, and you can see it's on our website. Um, and then we, we offer basically three different, three different finishes um, as, as far as our standard you know, housing side of things goes, and three different levels for each of those three finishes. So if you're looking for, you know, you want this aesthetic and you want a really simple basic home, you know, you can say, you know, I want floor plan two, I want, um, you know, a rust, modern rustic finish, and I want level two. And there's a list of everything that's included in each of those finishes. So really, the, the core of our business is still custom. Um, you know, someone comes to us with an African sketch and we turn that into a house kind of client. Um, but then this is for people who, that, that's not for them. They, they want a house that they want to basically, you know, pick options. Um, and so we're, we're basically, this is just us trying to play around with the formula for our business. And sort of the horizon for us is similar uh, to David in, in communities. Um, it's sort of, it's, it's not really a new thing for us. It's kind of what the initial dreams of our company were revolved around a tiny house community in the down, in the, in the urban overlay of Chattanooga. Um, and all the pieces are there. Um, similar, you know, it sounds like Nashville, is, there's just a few things that, that it would take for it to become a reality. Um, and, uh, you know, in the next year to two years is, is sort of our, our large goal is to get a tiny house community um, you know, whether we're partnering with somebody to do it or whether we're doing it ourselves or whatever in the downtown of Chattanooga. Um, and I'm not going to expound on all the reasons why that's a good idea because it was done very eloquently. Um, but yeah, that's, that's us. I don't I actually don't have any cards, so if you come up to me afterwards, I'm not going to have a card for you. I ran out yesterday. But here's our info <laughs> right here. Um, yeah, I'll take some questions. What's the whole part weight? Um, about 20, 22 to 26, you said, feet? Just 26, without the trailer. Um, we only build on trailers, so I wouldn't be able to give you a without the trailer weight. Um, but uh, this house is going to weigh in at probably about 12,500 pounds. you modify that trailer space or just buy space? We have a custom trailer maker uh, that's local to Chattanooga that builds how you know, trailers specifically to our specification, you know, to hold that weight. What's the, you uh, get it down to the average square foot that you're building typically, and then uh, do you have a ballpark figure what it costs you per square foot finish at uh, free of one of those? Yeah, um, so it depends on whether you're calculating including the loft or not. Um, we've done with, we've done both. If you're calculating, uh, with loft square footage, it comes in at, a, at uh, I would say our most requested model is a 24 foot long by you know standard 86 width, um, and that comes in without loft at like 196. Someone can check my math um, or something like that, and with loft like 220 to 40 something like that. Um, 
and that size house um, in a in our highest level, as you said, is going to be probably anywhere between sixty and sixty-five thousand for for us to build. Um, we have got prices on our website too about that stuff. Me medium would be about fifty-five. Uh, our base model could be forty-eight to fifty. That's about what the um, infographics for tiny houses across the nation will give you about two hundred square two hundred dollars a square foot for the average quality of. Yeah. So if you go more luxury, you're going to spend a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's incredibly affordable for the level of luxury <laughs> Yeah, we, our, our goal is like, we, we started off like do, doing these crazy over the top custom stuff and like the economics weren't working out the best. So we've had to become a little more expensive, but we don't want to be obscenely expensive. We want to be obtainable for most people because um, we want to be able to afford these, or provide these really awesome, well-crafted tiny houses and to, in a, in a, at a level that's still accessible to most people, um, you know, so that's sort of our motto. So, I, a lot of RVs have expandable sections. Yeah. Have you done any experimentation? We have not. Tiny Idaho Homes does, does those, and I, there might be some other guys that do those. Um, I actually saw one in Tennessee that had those as well. I don't know who built it, but um, we don't do it, um, and it's Partly because of uh, just kind of our motto as a company, and partly for kind of pragmatic reasons. Um, simplicity is really core to you know the Tans movement and us as people, you know, and so or us as a company. And so we just feel like you know keeping with that theme, you know, just having a, having a structure. You know, I've, it's 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 been market tested by me and my and my uh, business partners. We all live in tiny houses, so like it's a super livable space. When you have the slide out. Um, it's taking the simplicity away on that level, but then also you're adding a bunch of opportunity for leakage, especially for a long term um, tiny house dweller who's planning on living in their house for 30 to 50 years. We just feel like having a slide out and introducing a huge seam where water can get in there is, is decreasing the lifespan of your house. I'm also a fan of the closed cell phone I'm considering as well. Uh -huh. I'm concerned about ventilation. Um, ventilation, uh, for getting fresh air in your house, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. So um, we put like a small bathroom. You know, we put we put I don't know what they are, seventy or ninety CFM bathroom fans in all of our houses. And if I flip that fan on um, and crack a window, like there's like air like hitting me in the chest. Like, <laughs> and if you think about the 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 air changes per hour, like how much it would take. You know, it's, there's not much air it would take to introduce in your tiny house to completely get a whole new fresh you know, a fresh air in there. Um, so they are incredibly tight. It's sort of that, it's that weird balance of like, you want to build a really tight house, you know, that's that's thermally efficient, you know, heats cool, heats cools well, but then you also don't want to suffocate. Um, so, and it's this, it's actually, we just built a permanent, I'm gonna go into a long story, I'll try to keep it real short. Um, we just built a permanent foundation house um, in Chattanooga, and Chattanooga is using the 2009 energy requirements, uh, the, you know, the international building requirements. Um, and our house uh, met the like the 2015 energy requirements, and essentially they told us our house was too efficient. So we had to essentially poke holes in the house and put vents in because our house was too efficient. Even though that's that is the 2015 requirements is the ones we were building to, but they're they're still stuck in 2009. So anyways, it's this it's this weird. You're not going to suffocate. Is the, is the short answer? Um, just just the fact of going into your house and opening doors. You know, introduces a ton of fresh air, um, and so it's not. We haven't found it to be an issue, you know, for the year we've been in our house, and neither has Travis, and he's been in his for about two years, so no mold issues or anything like that for us. Sure. We have about five minutes left, so I'm gonna yeah, maybe open it back yeah, up yeah, to yeah. the entire group, and we'll transfer the microphone. Uh, five more minutes of questions. Yeah. Can I ask for both of the companies what the average turnaround is for a house? Uh, for a standard 24 footer, seven weeks. Seven to eight. Uh, high end, maybe nine or ten. Yeah. So, are, are most of the tiny house communities that are established? Are they they all fall under the um, RV park, or do other states have other kinds of zoning? 
It, it really does depend on the state, um, and it depends on the, um, the local zoning to that particular location. Um, the easiest way is it, it commonly is to buy something that's already zoned as an RV park. It also also tends to already have like black water facilities and gray water and all of that stuff, which is kind of nice, right? Because it's pre-built. But you have communities in Asheville, uh, North Carolina, um, that just have a different type of uh, zoning makeup to for the local community. Uh, what about heating and cooling? You mentioned the space heater. Are there other ways to heat and cool these tiny houses? Yeah, you name it. We have a Pioneer split system in ours, and it is amazing. A what now? It's a Pioneer split system. So it does both the AC and the heat. Okay. Other than that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's Pioneer's brand, but mini splits do both, and they also get a lot of circulation. The, the, the mini split is probably the most common option. Uh, the mini split, a uh, ductless mini split. Um, there's, you know, if you want to be off the grid, then you probably are going to have propane, maybe, or wood heat, something like that. <clears throat> and then if, you know, fans, you know, they have really high efficiency fans if you're off the grid. Okay. Uh, if we're building these as just normal people, do we need stamped or, like, signed off drawings <laughs> to build them and live in them? And can you get homeowner's insurance on them? That's a really good question. Um, if you're building it as a, as a person, it's, it's on wheels, there's nobody that's regulating that right now. So go a while and have fun. Um, I, I would say that um, that I would build to a code. Um, so the American Tiny House Association has a set of guidelines that they recommend. Um, uh, the RBIA uh, board has a building code um, that you could follow. And the reason is that if you're pulling it and it's on wheels and uh, you're going to, you've got people behind you and you're going 70, like you want to know that it's safe, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there is another, um, there's actually, we talked to Jerry about this a little bit later, there's another organization that's um, popping up right now that's, developed, that's going to be certifying tiny houses, specific to, to tiny houses, and that organization is called NOAA, um, but they're not up and running just yet. Um, but uh, that was the first part of your question. The second one, yeah, is that fifth building plan? Homeowner insurance. Homeowner insurance. Um, I have heard, um, that Progressive will cover them. Um, if you email me, I'll try and get the contact because if you just call up their number, they'll probably be like, what, can I see pictures? I know because I've tried. Um, and then they'll say, no, you can't cover that. Um, but uh, if you're out west, there is a specific uh, guy, Daryl. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's only like in five states. It, it's, it's in five states, but they've just added six or seven more, and Tennessee is slated to be by February. Great. You're going to be able to get insured through. I don't remember the name, uh, Tiny House Insurance or something like that. You, if you Google Tiny House Insurance, Daryl, and I'll be getting his insurance. It's, D. it's still a pretty small community. Insurance. Yeah. All right, uh, this is a real estate question. Um, have any of you guys ever lived in a house? It's a negative question, but have you looks good a storm of some what's your, what's your experience going through harsh weather? Not necessarily. I've been through two tornadoes in shoddy construction before. It's a little bit terrifying. Um, yeah, I have. Um, and my wife is terrified of tornadoes, so um, it was, yeah, it wasn't a tornado, but it was, you know, there was some thunderstorms uh, like last summer. There's some times where there's some pretty strong wind. Um, we have ours anchored down as a mobile home would be anchored down, so they make these auger anchors that are about four feet long with these huge, basically it's a huge screw. You screw it into the ground and then you strap the frame of your house to that. And it's, it's, I think the way I did it, I actually added two more than I needed to. And it's supposed to be rated to up to 120 mile an hour winds. Um, and the way the actual house is constructed, it's built to be going down the road at 70 miles an hour with a possible headwind of 20 or 30 miles an hour. So um, it's, they're incredibly tight compared to a normal house. There's minimal, air intru minimal to no air intrusion um, of any kind and incredibly rigid as well in terms of proportional rigidity. I also, uh, so uh, I'm not from an area where there's tornadoes, and uh, so it really surprised me every time. Uh, we had recently, right, and we had a guest in our tiny house actually, um, who she's like, we're good. And I'm like, okay. Um, but uh, if you didn't tie it down or you were concerned, you can also um, build or have installed a tornado shelters like you get at Home Depot, um, like on a concrete pad. So you can dig one. I mean, it's hard to dig in Nashville. Um, the, the thing about tiny houses are, uh, if you haven't insured, 
Um, it's going to cost you $40,000 to rebuild. The insurance company is going to probably be much happier with that than the $250,000 to build your, your own home. Um, but part of the philosophy is it's just things, right? So get out and get safe, but don't worry so much about the house. It's just a thing. I mean, to reiterate what Jeremy said, they are built, and I have to mention this, they're built to withstand earthquakes and hurricane force winds. So I, I would be surprised that it didn't just like flip over in a worst case scenario. Uh, like it's, the wind is not, it, it's to me more, uh, less susceptible to wind damage than a foundation, right? maybe a brick foundation. Right? Just one, one tag on to that. Um, and you had mentioned this during your presentation, which is, I, I can't stress enough. The fact that the tiny house industry currently is largely unregulated means you have to ask all, all the right questions when you're choosing your tiny house builder. Specifically, how do you fasten the house to the trailer? Um, do you use hurricane straps? How do you, you know, I would get a builder to come with you or, or at least give you a list of questions, you know, if you're thinking about getting, you know, because there is a big variation between, you know, uh, ways that people do things. Um, I just want to be conscious of time, and I'm sure some of our speakers might want to stay over, but let's do last question, uh, Mike. How much land would you need to do a tiny house community, and what would be your density per acre for that community? I mean, it's up to you. Yeah, I mean, some people in the tiny house movement really want like an acre, and they want a giant, you know, and so if you have a big pot of land and you say you get an acre, you're going to attract the people that want an acre. But to do that Oregon community. I'm sorry? To do that Oregon community? To, to do one of those tiny house communities? What, what is the advocacy? I, I, I can just speak to Chattanooga. I'll speak to Chattanooga a little bit and maybe that'll apply to here and other places. Chattanooga's average lot is about 50 wide by 100 deep. Um, and we, we've just done initial sketching and kind of initial, you know, Dreaming and, and brainstorming about communities, you know, in our company, um, we would probably do three to four per lot that size. So I don't know if that translates to per acre, but probably ten to fifteen per acre. Um, and it depends again on what, like I said, on um, is this an urban, you know, infill? Is, is it is this meant for an urban infill? If so, you're going to have more dense, obviously. Um, if, is this a homesteader community on uh, 20 acres? If so, you're going to have less dense. You know, it just kind of depends on the intended market for the community. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy, for having us.